Good morning. And a very warm welcome to worship. Welcome to church. If you're visiting St. Nicholas today, we're delighted to see you and we hope you feel very much at home. Let nobody feel a stranger within the walls of this holy place today. The psalmist writes, let all the earth acclaim God, sing to the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Let us worship God. We sing his praise in hymn number 30, the metrical Psalm 40, to the tune Balerma, I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. Let us pray. Composer of the cosmos, you orchestrate our days and you nurture each season's song. We bring you this day our praise and our adoration. You sound the notes of the seaweed and shore, of hillside and glen. You sound the grace notes of kindness and hope, of courage and justice and peace. Let your holy presence fill the air around, ringing out like a melody to which the whole world might learn to dance. Lord, it's great to be alive on a day like today, so keep us singing along with you. How can it be then that we so often shut our ears to the sound of your singing? Our hymns fall flat, our praise gives way to noisy jangles. We shout to make ourselves heard, Pardon us, we beseech you. We confess that we are deafened by the clatter and clamor of many sounds and voices. Forgive us, we pray. Open our ears to the music of the universe. Here, Lord, in this place, we listen to the music of life, the voices of our children, the questions of the seekers, the rhythm of each heartbeat, young and old. Here, you're aware of the discordant sounds that fill some of our lives, the anger we harbor, the resentments we feel, the grudges we bear, the minor chords which strike and leave us jaded and bewildered. You're aware, too, of the soaring descants of wonder and awe, 
uplifting and majestic when we are filled with gratitude and awe. Take each of the notes that we bring today and create a symphony that unites us and calms us, a serenade that echoes back to you your love song given to us in Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord of all being, open our ears this day that each of us may hear the echoes of unseen heaven's praise, the songs of the redeemed, those who surround us now, unseen but in the fellowship of faith, that together we may glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to see two boys and girls who have come all the way from far away from Dubai to with us today. Lovely to see you. Lewis, hello, Lewis. You're a big boy since we last saw you last year. Lovely to see you. The dinosaur is more interesting than me, actually, Lewis. Uh, <laughs> Lovely to see you all. School holidays now? Yes, school holidays. And of course, with the school holidays comes the rain. It happens every year. We have lovely sunshine, and then the schools go on holiday, and the rain comes. Now, here in the west of Scotland, we get a lot of rain. That's why our countryside is so lush and green. Now, yesterday, I had four American visitors come to see me. And I took them a tour of Ayrshire, and we managed to get out of the car in between the showers. And they said, we now know why Scotland is so green, because of the amount of rain that you get. Now, what do we use to keep the rain off us, to keep dry? Yes, Rudy? An umbrella. And a coat. Yes, I've got both with them this morning. An umbrella and a coat. Now, the first recorded umbrella was in China about 3,000 years ago, and it was made not to keep the rain off, but in fact to keep the sunshine off, the first umbrella. And many years ago, owning an umbrella was a mark of rank. If you had an umbrella, you were a very important person indeed. And a chief of an African tribe would always carry around an umbrella because that gave him a certain distinction. And at one time, and I only found out this, this past week, at one time, His Holiness the Pope was accompanied by two umbrellas everywhere he went to show that he was a person of distinction, not just here on earth, where it rains, but in heaven too, where presumably it doesn't, because the Holy Father's second umbrella was never opened. It was always carried around or rolled up. I bet you didn't know that. Well, you know now. Now, when umbrellas were first used in this country, they were very heavy indeed. And in fact, they were so heavy that very often you needed a servant to carry that around for you. But it was a man called Samuel Fox who one day was travelling in the steam train from the island of Anglesey across the Menai Straits to the mainland of Wales. And as he was crossing the bridge, he was infatuated by the elegant tubular structure that the bridge was made of, and that inspired Samuel Fox to devise a light metal flame that we use in our umbrellas today. Now, at the time of Jesus, boys and girls, there was, there was no umbrellas, and in the land of Jesus, there wasn't very much rain, some rain in December and January, but for the rest of the year, it was very hot indeed, lots of sunshine. But when Jesus spoke about the rain, and he did that on several occasions. He said that God sends the rain on both the good and the bad. He sends it on both the good and the bad. Now, when I was a young minister in the village of Nielsen, a dear old lady in the congregation taught me a little rhyme which says, and I've never forgotten it, the rain, it falls on the just and the unjust fella, but mainly on the just because the unjust got his umbrella. I've never forgotten that little phrase. Now, in the Old Testament, God is often described as the rain. In other words, God is something, somebody without whom we can't live. Without the rain, what would happen if we didn't have any rain? Ruri? Plants wouldn't grow, yes. Correct. Because water is life. We need water. Water is so important indeed. And if it didn't rain everything would die. Rain is essential. 
And without God, we cannot have a full and a useful life. Now, some people think we can go through life without God, but that's not quite the case. Life isn't useful and full if they don't have God in their lives. The gift of rain, believe it or not, is one of God's greatest blessings. So when we're tempted, as we are today, to moan about the heavy showers, and we get out our umbrellas and our coats, let's remember that water means life, and that God means life. And as Billy Connolly once said, in Scotland there is no such thing as bad weather. It's only that we're wearing the wrong kind of clothes. <laughs> now let's sing your hymn, hymn 200. And 45, hymn 245, it's a world of sunshine, a world of rain. Now, is this a new hymn? Yes, it is. It's a good, it was written by a friend of mine from university days, Ian, who's just retired from being minister of Kirtan Church in Kirluk. And it's a great hymn. You'll soon get to know the tune. It's a world of sunshine, a world of rain. It's a world of laughter, a world of pain. <laughs> Let us hear the Word of God as we find it contained in the Scriptures of the Old Testament in the book of Psalms and Psalm 8. Let us hear God's Word. The psalmist writes, Lord, our Sovereign, how glorious is your name throughout the world. Your majesty is praised as high as the heavens. From the mouths of babes and infants at the breast, you have established a bulwark against your adversaries to restrain the enemy and the Avenger. When I look up at your heavens, the work of your fingers, at the moon and the stars you have set in place, what is a frail mortal that you should be mindful of him, a human being that you should take notice of him? Yet you have made him little less than a god, crowning his head with glory and honor. 
You make him master over all that you have made, putting everything in subjection under his feet. All sheep and oxen, all the wild beasts, the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, and everything that moves along ocean's paths. Lord our sovereign, how glorious is your name throughout the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir will sing the morning anthem, The Lord is my shepherd. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It was a former poet laureate whose poems I love, and many of you will know the, his poems too, John Betjeman. John Betjeman who said, hymns are the poetry of the people. And in the Presbyterian Church, in the Protestant Church, we love to sing hymns. Our faith, what we believe, is often sung, and the choice of praise of every worship service is of supreme import in the life of every congregation. 
Now, we all know the popularity of programs like Songs of Praise, which has been around for over 60 years now, though I have to confess that I was very disappointed a few years ago when the BBC moved it from its slot in a Sunday evening to a Sunday lunchtime. And in my last congregation, we had the privilege of broadcasting one Sunday evening on BBC Radio 2. In my last congregation, we had the privilege of broadcasting one Sunday evening on BBC 2 Radio 2 Sunday Half Hour, when the folks of St. Columba and Ayer sang their hearts out in some of our favourite hymns, and the amount of letters and cards that I received in the ensuing weeks from all over the UK was quite humbling. One of them I remember in particular was from an old lady in Leamington Spa, who was in her late 80s, who said that that half hour of hymn singing each Sunday night was her strength for the week ahead. Hymn singing so important to us. Hymns resonate with people, whether they're regular worshippers or whether they've not set foot in a church in years. They speak to the depths of their souls. And chances are that for many of us here in church today, our earliest memories of worship have indeed a musical soundtrack. The majestic pipe organ, the choir in their stalls, the lady in the pew behind who sang off key, you may not remember any points from any sermon you heard growing up, but you can remember singing from your earliest years, all people that on earth do dwell, or love divine, all love's excelling. And when you sang them, when you joined a congregation in singing, you were moved. Why? Because you experienced God's presence in a way that words alone cannot capture. When there's absolutely no way to say what we're feeling, that's when music and song are so important to us. Now that revelation is as old as the Bible. Moses' sister Miriam sang a song of thanksgiving after Israel had escaped from the bondage of Egypt and through the Red Sea away from captivity. Mary, Zechariah, Simeon all sang in response to the gift of the Christ child. And the Gospels record for us that Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn on the night before his death. St. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, urges us to keep singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. It's a scriptural injunction to sing. And the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, is filled with singing at the anticipation of the coming judgment and the new Jerusalem. And one whole book of the Scriptures, the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms was the Hebrew songbook. That was the Psalms that they sang in the synagogue and the temple. It's a collection, of course, today of 150 hymns and prayers. And since my childhood days, hymns have been part and parcel of my life. From boyhood to teenage years, from young adulthood to more mature years, there have been hymns that have accompanied me on my Christian journey. I can remember in primary two at the Thorn School in Johnson, Miss Buchanan, who wheeled the piano into the classroom every day, and we would sing songs that you don't, I haven't heard it for years. The morning bright with rosy light has waked me up from sleep, and, and golden harps are sounding, angel voices ring. Hymns that are redolent of times and places and faith on life's sometimes erratic journey. We all have them. You hear them played, you sing them, and a whole crowd of emotions come flooding in upon us. I can remember as a young student going along with the minister of Paisley Abbey where I was serving an assistantship. Jimmy Ross took me along to Mrs. Warner who lived in a little attic flat in a room and kitchen, I suppose it would be called, in Castle Street in Paisley. Now, she lost her husband in the First World War. Her only son had died, and we celebrated the sacrament together. And then, as was tradition before we left, Mrs. Warner put on a record on her old radiogram, Dame Clara Butt singing, Abide With Me, Fast Falls the Eventide. And she sang along with it. Without looking at the words, she knew the words off by heart. Be still my soul, praise my soul, the King of Heaven. The list is endless. So why are our hymns so vital 
to our Christian faith? Why do we lay such store upon their words and indeed the tunes? Well, quite simply, hymns connect us to God. They bring us closer to God and he draws closer to us. They are vehicles whose words and music link us to the eternal and they link us to the church throughout the world and they unite us to the church triumphant in heaven. They comfort us. They challenge us. They inspire us. They encourage us and they draw us closer together. There's nothing so uplifting as a congregation singing their hearts out this feeling of unity, togetherness. So here we are now in the summer months of relaxation and the chance to do something different. And as I said last Sunday, I'm departing from the lectionary texts that we follow every Sunday in our preaching, and I'm hoping to preach of some of the great hymns of inspiration that we love so much and why they're so important to us. Because behind every hymn, there's a wonderful story. Hymns. And in a world of strident and discordant voices, in a world of shouting and dissonance, we come to church on Sundays and we sing hymns. In a world of shouting, God gives us songs. Songs that unite us in love and harmony with saints and sinners, both alive and dead, of every nation and every tongue, and with angels and all the company of heaven. Hymns do that. In our scripture this morning, the author of Psalm 8 stared into the night sky and was very dazzled at what he saw. When I consider the heavens, he said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? When I hear these words, I'm transported back to my visit to Balmoral Castle and the night, on the Saturday night when I was there, her, Majesty, her late majesty, the queen, asked me to go out to walk the dogs out into the night sky. And as we stood at the door of Balmoral, her majesty looked up and she said, Sam 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him when I consider the heavens? Doesn't the night sky make you feel so small, Mr. Aitken? Indeed, to put it mildly, what the psalmist did not see would have undoubtedly have made him feel even smaller. The psalmist saw pinpricks of light twinkling in the night sky, and he was overjoyed. Had he been able to look through the Hubble telescope, he would have seen the birth of new stars. It is estimated that there are at least 10 billion galaxies in the universe, with each galaxy perhaps containing a hundred billion stars. I find that fact mind-blowing. Not only are the stars we see in the night sky far away, they are but a mere fraction of what is really out there. And even Psalm 8 admits that the wonders of the universe are humbling. And of course, we don't need to delve into the depths of space for such wonders. Just bask, as I do, in those outstanding programs on television with the brilliant Sir David Attenborough telling us about the natural world. Arctic terns flying 10,000 miles round trip each year, 10,000 miles from their winter home in the Antarctic to their summer home in Asia. Our world and our universe are clotted with wonder. And as for us, as Christians, behind the Big Bang, behind evolution, and the billions of years that have gone before us, is the one whom we call God, the maker of heaven and earth, the creator, the designer, the great artist. Friends, I don't know what brought you to church today. For some, it's a good habit, something you do every Sunday, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Thank God for you. Maybe you're here visiting, and we're delighted that you've joined us. Thank you for coming this morning. Some of you may have come this morning, you're going through a rough patch, and you're hoping beyond hope for some encouragement because you're facing some problem, some concern. Well, may I say to you now that the first sermon in this series 
will help you because it will take your eyes off your situation and off of yourself and lift them to God, the one who is greater than all our problems. The author of Psalm 8 had that sense of awe and wonder. For him, the cosmos teemed with life, with complexity, with music, and with movement. Now, that Psalm 8 in the original Hebrew only consists of 70 Hebrew words, but it directs us how to think about God, about creation, and about their relation. Now, we're living in a day when creation becomes more and more part of the political agenda, and to the ancient Israelites, creation mattered enormously. They regarded themselves as big people who were told by God to look after creation. And God's plan for his people, his purposes, his promises, are again and again tied together with things like soil and fruit, with flocks and meadows, with wine and wheat, with milk and honey. Creation matters because, as Psalm 8 makes perfectly clear, God himself loves it. Psalm 8 is the first psalm of praise in the book of Psalms. And it's also the only psalm in all 150 psalms that is a direct address to God throughout all its verses. It speaks to God and to him alone. Look at the world around, says the psalmist, and you're looking at the very glory of God. His name is invisible. His name is visible in all the earth. His fingerprint is in all creation. God's presence in the cosmos runs the gamut from the stars in the night sky, the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away from us. And we could never travel that distance. The constellations are in the heavens to the gossamer threads of a butterfly's wings. God made it all as we sang in the children's hymn. It's God's world. He remains active in its preservation. He remains vital interest in its flourishing. And that's why climate change and all the things to do with conservation are essential parts of our Christian witness. Now, whether you're looking into a microscope or a telescope, whether you're watching a pod of dolphins leaping in the firth, or notice the wondrous design of your own hand and the fingerprints, every one of them different, what you're seeing, friends, is nothing less than the glory of God the Creator. And our chosen hymn this morning is How Great Thou Art. That offers the same glorious meditation and song of the wonders of the natural world, God's glorious act of creation. Now, the story behind it is quite an involved story. It was written originally in Swedish by a pastor and poet called Karl Boberg in 1885. It's said to have been written that he wrote the words after a thunderstorm suddenly appeared as he was walking home from the church where he was minister. A strong wind began to blow, a driving rain and darkness fell, and when Karl Boberg arrived home, wet and chilled to the bone, the storm passed as suddenly as it had come. He looked out of the window over the clear bay, and he heard the church bells ringing in the distance. And we're told that he lifted up the window, smelled the air that you smell right after a storm, that cleansing air. And a sense of profound wonder and peace came over him, and he sat down at his study desk and penned the words that we sing today. Have you ever felt like that? When we're small, remember when you're small, everything's got a sense of awe and wonder. Our eyes light up because there's always new discoveries, new experiences, new truths to learn, and everything seems bigger and greater. But as we get older, as we become more sophisticated and grow up, as we pass into adulthood, we start thinking that we're far too big for awe and wonder. Nothing really takes the breath away from us. We're too big to be impressed. We've seen it all before. For the Christian, our God is a God who is awesome. We can never fully understand him. We can never completely define him. He is beyond our understanding. And to have that sense of awe and wonder is very closely connected to what we do here on a Sunday morning. 
It's coming to recognize the greatness, the otherness, the holiness, the majesty of God. It's the idea that we're looking up and praising the one who is bigger than us and bigger than our problems, bigger than our situation. Karl Boberg's song passed through numerous translations in the following years, first into German and then into Russian, and little by little it started going around Europe in different languages. And in the 1930s, the hymn was translated into English by the Reverend Stuart Hine. Stuart Hine was a British missionary who was working with his wife in Ukraine. And at the outbreak of World War II, Hine and his wife had to return to these shores. And after the hostilities had ceased and the refugees and the displaced persons of Eastern Europe wanted to go back home, he was so deeply moved by those homeless people and he thought, where is the real home for these Ukrainians and Poles and Lithuanians? And the last hymn was born then, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. How Great Thou Art finally started gaining popularity in the United States and in Europe by its use in the Billy Graham Crusades in the 1950s and 60s. And many of a certain generation will recall George Beverly Shea singing it at those huge evangelistic rallies in the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow. Elvis recorded it twice and won a Grammy both times. And folk are still singing it it's constantly voted a favorite of viewers and songs of praise year after year after year. How great thou art. Way back in 1976, remember that year of the heat wave here in Scotland? While I was working as a student with the Presbyterian Church in Canada for four months, and I had the chance, of course, to go to visit Niagara Falls, and while I was saving the grandeur and beauty of God's creation, I suddenly heard the sound of a violin playing the hymn, How Great Thou Art. I looked around, and there was a middle-aged man playing the tune. And then suddenly from nowhere, people began to congregate and gather, and they started singing, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hand hath made. I heard it in German. O mein Herr, mein Gott, wenn ich hier fürchtig stehne. I heard it in French, Dieu tout puissant, quand mon cœur considère. Dutch, Mandarin, Spanish, and other languages which I couldn't identify. And I found that my feet started navigating towards the group, and I joined in the singing. Now, we didn't know each other, we couldn't each other understand each other's languages, but we were still singing it loud from our hearts. The great Canadian and the Horseshoe Falls and the American Falls crashed below us, but our voices sang above them, Christians from across the globe singing praises to their Creator. Friends, this is a hymn which reminds us that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves, a God whose majesty and splendor is revealed in all creation, from the galaxies to the amoeba that we cannot see with the naked eye. A God who in Christ became one of us is so astonishing we scarce can take it in. A God who in Christ and his cross tells us that there is nothing in our world that's so broken, that's so flawed, that it cannot be redeemed by the saving, healing power of his love. In every sentence of this majestic hymn that we'll sing in a moment or two, we see the fingers of God out of love, displayed across the universe and the natural world. Out of love, we see the forgiving power of the figure of our Lord on Calvary's cross. And out of love, we see the final consummation of Christ's victory when the, we, the redeemed will be gathered home. Now, this well-loved hymn, built to an amazingly glorious crescendo, with every fiber of creation lifting its voice in song. How great thou art. So is that how we sing every Sunday? Is that how we worship? Do we belt it out, our internal amplifier being cranked up to full volume? 
I'm guessing that for most congregations, the answer would be a resounding no. If singing's supposed to be full-bodied prayer, then most of us, friends, are only whispering. Oh, I understand that, all right, I fully understand. It's so easy for us to be self-conscious about our singing, but I would want you not to be self-conscious. We don't want to be that person in the pew that everyone around talks about after the service is finished. Did you hear that person so ill in the pew behind us? Well, I don't think it was. I think it was just Fraser singing. I get it. I get it. But here's the thing. God doesn't care. You and I are called to sing. A choir rehearsal each Sunday for heaven. That's what worship is. We come to church to worship God, to praise Him, and when our choir sings their anthem, or when Israel plays a moving prelude, they're not performing for us. It's not a performance. This isn't a concert hall. It's a sanctuary. And they are praising God with their gift of music. You and I also have that gift, that gift of singing. Everybody here today, no matter what you tell me, can sing. Now, notice I didn't say sing well. But you can sing. And we're here simply to lift up our voices in praise of him who's created us, who's created the universe and the world, the God who has redeemed us, and who brings us blessings to us on our journey through life. Remember that story in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas were thrown into prison for preaching the gospel? And what did they start doing? Started preaching, oh no, they a choir practice. They started to sing. And there was an earthquake. And they were freed. I'm willing to try it. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all honor and glory as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The hymn 154, How Great Thou Art.
We're delighted to welcome visitors today, and we hope you'll join us for tea and coffee in the Kirk Cafe. And if you go through this door here and go straight along the, 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 the new halls at the end of the corridor, we'll be delighted to see you. And the, our hostesses will be serving tea and coffee. There's a great chance for us to meet before we go home every Sunday. Louise, who organizes our Kirk Cafe, is looking for volunteers to make tea and coffee and to wash up on Sunday mornings for the month of July. So if you can help, would you please speak to Louise after the service to today? The service of prayer for healing, organized by King Case Parish Church and St. Nanny's Episcopal Church, will take place this afternoon, and everyone's warmly invited at four o'clock to St. Ninian's for the service of healing. Tomorrow, we are honored to welcome Alessandro Bianchi from Italy, who will perform in the Organist Entertains program here in St. Columba. Now, Alessandra, Alexandro was born in Como, and he's organist of St. Edward the Confessor Anglican Church in Lugano. Concert tours, he's played in over 2,300 recitals as a soloist in most countries of Europe, the USA, Mexico and Brazil, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia and South Africa. And he is coming tomorrow and we look forward to a wonderful programme. I have the programme here and amongst them are some well-known. He's playing an arrangement of Brahms' Cradle Song, Variations on Fugue on God Save the King, We Shall Overcome the Negro Spiritual, and Fantasia on the Old Hundredth, and Louis Verne's wonderful Carolyn of Westminster. So it's a great program tomorrow, a rich variety of music, and you're warmly and welcome at 12 o'clock. It's an hour long, and it's priced five pounds um, for entry. We are maintaining the service for lifts to church on a Sunday morning and we're requiring extra drivers at the present time. And if you could maybe give a Sunday a month or whatever, if you could speak please to our organiser, Mr Bryce Wilson. Bryce will be delighted to hear from you. We have an intimation from our treasurer, Bill Ritchie. Bill says that the boiler replacement appeal has raised to date £9,180 and the Christian aid envelopes returned to the church have raised £471.37. And, and Bill extends thanks to all who contributed to both of these. The service of thanksgiving for Mr. Craig Brown, CBE, will be held on Tuesday, the 25th of July, at 1 p.m. at the Princess Royal Suite at Air Racecourse. Our warmest consolation and our prayers are extended to Joan, to Valerie, to Hugh and John, and to all the family at this sad time in their lives. Let us pray. We praise you, generous God, that this day music breaks loose into the world. We thank you for music festivals, for orchestras and conductors and choirs, for soloists and all those who bring such happiness into our lives through the gift of music. We rejoice in song. We rejoice, Lord, in sound. We sing your praise in many accents, many tempos, many harmonies, knowing that you love variety. How wonderful is the diversity in nature which you have fashioned, spirit of beauty and goodness and love. Wind of God, blowing from the four corners of the globe, breathe hope into those areas of our world beset by disease and famine, by drought and disaster. Surround our relief agencies and governments that together they may work to bring healing and food, water and comfort to all our human family. Hurricane of God, blowing across our troubled world, a world in which the terrorist strikes and bombs kill and maim and peace seems so distant, overturn the ways of evil that tanks may be turned into tractors, that nations may live and work together, sharing resources, supporting the weak. Breath of God, 
energize this land of ours in these days fraught with fear and uncertainty? Whisper in the ears of our politicians and those who seek to solve our problems that they may find a way ahead. Uphold our doctors and our nurses, our teachers and our social workers, our emergency services, that the life of our communities may be strengthened. Upon Charles our King, grant your continued grace that he may be a bulwark of truth and dignity, of compassion and duty amid all the conflicting voices which surround us. Bless him and Queen Camilla as they come to Scotland to receive the honours of this land, that they may know the loyalty of the people and the prayers of the devout. To the church in these islands grant a fresh impetus that in these days when faith burns low, each congregation may be given the capacity to dream dreams and sing new songs. And here in this place, may all who cross our threshold find comfort in times of sadness. May they find friendship in times of loneliness, courage in times of fear, forgiveness in times of failure. That when worship is over, they may go their homeward way with a song in their heart, a spring in their step, and for all the saints who have gone before us, we praise your name. Their eyes still watch us on the galleries of heaven. Keep us ever mindful of all that they did to serve Jesus in their day, that we may too be inspired to follow in their steps. Great God of music and song, fill our hearts and our voices that we may indeed have a melody that brings joy to the courts of heaven. And as we present our gifts of money to you, we present ourselves to be used for Christ's glory. And in his words we pray together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jennifer, how was Judith? Was she okay? She's like, Judith, I'm glad to say that Judith's fine. She's okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Hymn 602, hymn 612. Come to us, creative spirit.
May our songs become our story. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and all those whom you love both near and far this day and forevermore.